And I'd like to talk to us tonight about the principle of obedience. I'd like to talk about obedience tonight, brothers and sisters, because there probably is not a more critical concept or principle of the gospel that we have to deal with now as young people than the principle of obedience. The reason that we come to meetings like this is so that we can learn how to identify the hazards and problems that face us as young people in the world. The reason we go to seminary is to learn to recognize the pitfalls that are out there and then try and avoid them. The reason we go to Sunday school, the reason we go through the primary program and junior Sunday school and then sacrament meetings, all the meetings we go to are training experiences. And these training experiences, young people, are vital to our survival. I'd like to tell you an experience tonight about a training experience that I went through and correlate that to the challenge that you and I have to obey the principles and commandments of the gospel. And we'll pay particular attention tonight, in as much as my wife has introduced the theme, to keeping ourselves morally clean. But I want to pay particular attention to that challenge that we have as young people to channel, direct, control these powerful desires and urges that we're beginning to experience. As I mentioned to you, when I got home from my mission, I went into the military. I had a missionary companion who came back about the same time I did, and we were both drafted into the army. He went into the infantry side of the military, and I went into the artillery side. I made particular care to get into the artillery because the artillery rides <laughs> and the infantry walks and he I guess didn't know that so he went into the infantry his name was Lee and we went through the training that this is when the Vietnam War was particularly getting hot and heavy and so a lot of the training that we experienced in basic training and advanced training and then when we both went on to officers training school a great deal of the training that we experienced was how to stay alive in Vietnam. As I mentioned, the Vietnam War was escalating and a lot of our young men were going over there and a lot of them were dying. And so the training was geared to teach us to stay alive in Vietnam. Now, as I sat there in that training, I began to discover some of the devices that the Viet Cong had developed to either kill or maim our guys. And I'd like to share a couple of those with you and then tell you about the training. One of the things that the Vietnamese developed was a thing called a punji stick. How many of you know what a punji stick is? Some of us know. I'm going to tell you what a punji stick is tonight. A punji stick is a bamboo rod about that long. And it's young bamboo. It's about as big around as my little finger. And they sharpen this bamboo rod to a very sharp razor point. And then they take this bamboo rod after they've sharpened it and they soak it in human urine for three days. And after they've soaked it, because it's very young bamboo and it, it sucks all this poison in, there's anything more poisonous than that after it sits, then they go along the trails that they know that the American GI is going to be walking on and they dig pits along both sides of the trail, about every 12, 15 feet. And these pits are just a little bigger than a man. They're about so wide, and they're about six feet, five inches long, and they're about three or four feet deep. They're about that deep. And after they've finished digging these pits, they fill the bottom of these pits with punji sticks. And they stick those punji sticks down in the mud, so the point's sticking straight up, and they're in the mud about that far. So they're showing about that high. And then they cover the top of these pits over meticulously so you can't tell that the ground has even been disturbed. Now, the reason they do that is because they know that the American GI, when he's walking down a trail, if he hears somebody shooting at him, the first instinct that he has, and that's the way they trained us during the Second World War, the first instinct is to dive off the trail for cover. And so when we first went to Vietnam, quite a few of our guys died in those pits. They'd dive off the trail. Sometimes they'd just shoot in the air, and the GIs would get scared and jump off the trail and land in these pits. Well, it's an ugly way to die. 
they decided after a while the GI discovered he didn't want to do that, and so he would at least jump in feet first, or he'd dive to the side of the trail feet first. And those things were so sharp they'd go right through the boot, and some of them would go clear up into the calf through the boot. And so the American Army put metal plates in the bottom of all of GI's shoes that went to Vietnam so that they wouldn't step on punji sticks. Well, they decided we'd better teach our guys to recognize these pits. And so a great deal of the training that we went through was to recognize, as we walked along a trail, these punji stick pits. Another little device they developed with punji sticks was they'd take a board about as big as that book and they'd stick about 20 of these things through a board. So they were sticking out in front of the board like that. And then they'd attach this board to a, a grown, mature bamboo pole, and they'd stick that across the trail on this bamboo pole and affix it to a tree here, and it's, there's heavy jungles there in Vietnam. And then they'd pull that board back this way so it was in the bushes. And then they would stick a little piano wire across the trail that was attached to this board. And if you're walking down this trail and you missed that wire and hit the wire, You'd hear a little sound, it'd go something like this, it'd go tch. And if you heard that sound, there isn't anybody alive fast enough to get out of the way. And that thing would come across the trail at about 80 miles an hour. And it'd hit you right about there. And we had quite a few of our guys who missed the wire, ended up with one of those boards attached to his chest. It's an ugly way to die. Another little device that they developed in Vietnam was a little mine about as big as a tuna fish can. And that mine was developed not to kill, but to maim. They knew that if they could blow a foot off or blow a leg off, that that would maim them pretty severely, and it would take three or four other GIs to get him back for help. They knew that if they killed him, they'd just leave him there, and the rest would keep on going in the assault. But if they could maim him, two or three of his buddies would want to get him back. And that would take, instead of just one out of the battle, it would take three or four out of the battle. So when they found out which way our guys were coming, they dropped these little tuna fish cans all over the place. And our guys would go walking through these fields and you'd hear these noises and guys would be losing their feet and their arms. And the Vietnamese were right. Three or four guys would help them back for help. So they decided we'd better learn to recognize those little tuna fish cans. There was another little device that they developed. It wasn't so little. It was a bigger mine, about so. And it was set down in the middle of the road, and it had a pressure plate. And the pressure plate was the only thing that showed, and they'd cover that with dust, so you couldn't hardly see it. And this thing was designed to blow the front end off a vehicle. So when we were going down these trails or these paths with our trucks, if we hit one of these mines, it would blow up the front end of a truck. Well, the way we identified those mines is we would take one of our GIs and sit him on the bumper of the truck. And it was his job to spot the mine. Now, do you suppose he was motivated to find those mines? <laughs> you better believe he was, because if he missed it, what would happen? He'd go with the front end of that truck. Well, part of the training then was to help us identify those mines. There was another little mine they had developed that was designed to kill, not just maim. It was a bigger one. It would level an area about the size of this room. And it was sunk in the ground, and the only thing that came up out of the ground were three wires, something like that. And those three wires were just barely about that big above the ground, and they'd be usually hidden in the grass. And if you tripped one of those wires, it would take you and everything within about a 20-yard radius with it. And so they decided we'd better learn to identify those little three wires, too. So a lot of the training that we went through was to learn to watch those. As I went through basic training, young people, they taught us how to recognize these hazards. And you know, the interesting thing that I found as I sat there in the warmth of Fort Polk, Louisiana, and witnessed all this training, I'd look around the rooms, the classrooms that I was in. How many of the guys do you suppose were asleep? About half. Half of them were asleep. And this bothered the instructors of the school somewhat, and so they decided they had to bring some realism into this training, and so they brought pictures back from Vietnam of people who had died in the pits or had been blown up by the mine. And they'd flash these color pictures up on the screen. That woke up about a third more of the class, but we still had quite a few that would sleep. 
And then they would have us go down trails in real life situations. And I'll never forget, on one day, I was going down a trail, and they had these wires across, and we were supposed to identify the wire. And they had just showed us the pictures of these things sweeping across the, the path, and they, the mines they'd have attached to these things. And so I was pretty interested in learning how to identify those wires. And I missed one, and they had some explosive charges that would go off on the side of the trail to let you know that you'd just blown it. And I tripped one of these wires, and that thing went off. How do you suppose I finished the rest of that trail? On my hands and knees, trying to find the next wire. That had lots of realism to me. Because as soon as those charges went off, the first thing that came through my mind was the pictures that I had seen of these men who had suffered in Vietnam. Well, the reason I share this with you is that we, in this kind of experience, and as we go through all of the meetings that we're asked to go to, are being taught to identify the punji stick pits, if you will, out there in our high schools and in our jobs and our business experiences. And there are just as real punji stick pits out there, young people, as there are in Vietnam. And we can be taught to identify them just as surely as we were taught in our experience in basic training. This missionary companion friend of mine I told you about, he went through infantry, and he became what they call the Green Beret, which is a different kind of a soldier. And they had a special uh, mission that they would perform, and he, he became a professional soldier. He went through jump school, became a paratrooper and a ranger and all the things that most career. He decided to make a career out of the military. Active in the church, strong, morally clean guy. Great young man. And he ended up going to Vietnam. I was fortunate. When I got out of our training in OCS, I ended up going to Europe because I got put in missiles and they didn't have that particular missile in Vietnam. And so I went to Europe and Lee went to Vietnam. And he developed, because he stayed awake in those classes, he developed an ability to recognize those little wires and the wire across the path. And he could recognize a punji stick pit from about 12 or 15 feet away. And because he had this ability, when he'd take his squad out into, and the Green Berets would go into enemy territory and come back by themselves on little missions, for 11 months, brothers and sisters, Lee would take his squad out, he was a lieutenant, and he always brought them back. And he carried in his pocket these little popsicle sticks. You seen these popsicle sticks, the little wooden sticks? And he had a little ribbon attached to each of them, and he would go in front of his squad, and as he identified the wires and the mines, he would stick a little stick next to it. And so as the rest of his troop would come by, they'd see his little markings, and they'd step over the mines and over the wires, and they'd avoid the punji stick pit. And he brought his guys back for 11 months without fail. And his men, as a result of that, really developed a love and respect for him because they couldn't even see it. And he'd spot it before they could even see it. And they'd have to get up right close before they could identify it. In the 11th month that Lee was in Vietnam, he was coming down one of these trails. This was in 1966. He was coming down one of these trails, and he took his eye off the trail just that long. And he missed one of these three-pronged mines. And as he walked down the trail, his foot brushed one of these little wires, and it went off. And it took him away clear to there. There wasn't enough left of Elder Richardson to send home. In fact, the coffin they sent home had rocks in it, as many of them did from Vietnam. The reason I share that with you tonight, brothers and sisters, is because that experience had great impact on me. And the impact was he listened. He knew. And this is, doesn't take anything away from Lee. He was there for 11 months. We are in high school for 12 years, and we may last right up until the graduation party. And if we take our eyes off that goal that we're establishing in this training experience that we're going through, just that long, we're going to find ourselves lying in one of those pits, experiencing just as real anguish, pain, and suffering as anybody did in Vietnam. 
That's the kind of pain that comes when we make the moral mistakes. Now, there isn't anybody in this room that doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. Not anybody. We all know. But for some reason, when we get away from the warmth of this experience in the chapel and we get away by ourselves, something happens. We begin to rationalize. We begin to want to be part of the group, don't we? Isn't there a pretty strong desire to be part of the in group at school. You young ladies will relate to this. There's usually a guy or several guys at your high school that every girl would just absolutely slit their wrist to go out with. And finally, one day, this guy calls you and asks you to go to the dance. And you're just ecstatic. And the other girls in the high school find out that you're going, and they say, oh, you're going out with him. <laughs> And they're just coveting something fierce. And you're walking around and say, yes, nothing to it. And you go to the dance that night and you're just ecstatic. And you've been through all these training experiences. You know to how to recognize those pits. And after the dance, he says, why don't we go to my house for a little while? A little red flag goes up in your mind. And you say, well, are your folks home? Oh, yeah, don't worry. My folks are home. And so you say, well, maybe it'll be all right. And so you go over to his house. And as you drive into the driveway, the lights are all off in the house. And he says, well, I guess folks aren't home. Oh. And you're a little nervous about that, but you go in the house, and as you walk in the house, you notice that the house is all ready. There are six records on the record player, and there's something to drink there on the table, and the lights are turned down just right as he walks in. What do you do? Well, if you adhere to the basic training you've gone to, you just see one big, fat, punji stick pit in that living room, don't you? And you look at him and say, look, nerd, take me home. <laughs> Is that difficult to do that? Because it, when you go to school Monday morning and all the other girls run up and say, oh, how was it with him? You have to say he's a nerd. <laughs> and when you tell them that he's a nerd, they'll say, what do you mean he's a nerd? Well, he took me to his house and he wanted to do things I don't believe in. And they'll say, you are crazy. Is that difficult to deal with? Do you remember the story in the 8th chapter of 1 Nephi in the great and spacious building? Do you remember that story? What were the people in the building doing about the people that were at the tree? Do you remember? They were pointing their finger at them. Now you're reading the Book of Mormon this year in seminary, and I assume that we're all going to seminary. Is that correct? Excellent. In that story, they're in the great and spacious building, and they're pointing at everybody at the tree, and they are scoffing and mocking, and they're saying things like, You turkeys! What are you doing at that tree? This is where it's at in the great and spacious building. I mean, we have rock bands and pot and all that good stuff. This is where it's at. And what did some of the people at the tree do? And they were ashamed. And they fell away and were lost into the building. Well, that's what happens in our high schools, isn't it? They come up to us and they put their finger in our nose and they say, you don't act or think or believe the way we do, and if you want to be happy here at this school, you'd better be the way we are. Isn't that true? Well, if we're listening in these basic training experiences, we can make it when that test comes. And there's going to be a test, isn't there? There is going to be a test. If you wait until you're up the canyon and the windows are all fogged up, it's too late. But if on the way up the canyon, you say, hey, where are we going? He said, well, I thought we'd go to the cave. And you say, turn around, nerd, and take me home. <laughs> That's what basic training does. And then you miss the pits, and you don't end up with all the pain that goes with it. Now, one of the reasons that I talk to you this way tonight is I hope and pray that the next time you have a chance to fail morally, and you'll all have that opportunity, often, when that boy or girl, depending on what the case is, and I want to tell you, young ladies, there are boys in your school that would have you if they could. And young men, there are girls in your schools that would have you and enjoy bringing you down to their level. The next time you have that opportunity and you're with one of those girls or young men, I want you to look at his forehead, and you know what you're going to see there? You're going to see a great green punji stick. Okay? Look for the punji stick. And then you'll say, holy smokes, get me out of this one. Now, let me tell you another one. <laughs> the Russian army has a very interesting tradition. 
And this tradition is after the Russian soldier has gone through his base... I love to tell army stories. That's why I talk about the army. When the Russian army soldier has finished his training, they have a big party for him. And one of the things that is a tradition is when he's having his party, his coming out party, he has to demonstrate his manhood. And they have this party, and the Russian barracks are five and six stories high, and they go to this top floor, and they have great big windows in these barracks, not like ours, and they're big enough for a man to stand in. That's how big these windows are. And the way he can prove his manhood is they drink all night, and they get absolutely stoned out of their mind. And the way he can prove his manhood is once he has become totally inebriated, if he can stand on this windowsill with his back facing a five-story drop and drink one more bottle of beer all the way down without falling out the window, he has proved his manhood. Now, isn't that slick? I don't know of anything smarter in my whole life than that. Well, the reason I tell you that is to introduce this phrase. And I want you to listen very carefully, and I want you to memorize this tonight. I'm not suggesting you quote me, because that might not be appropriate. But I want you to memorize this. Remember this story about the Russian soldiers and memorize these words. He who leans out a window to see how far he can lean without falling is a jackass. Will you remember that? He who leans out a window to see how far he can lean without falling. Okay? Will you remember that? When you decide you can handle it, young people, you can go to the can, you can go to the keggers because you can deal with it. You are leaning out that window just as Surely, as that Russian soldier was. Is that smart? Do smart people do that? Uh-uh. Second thing you're going to see next time you have a chance to fail is that drunken soldier leaning out the window. Here's another one. There's a bishop working with a young man who was wanting to become part of the group. And he wasn't responding to the counsel of the bishop, and he wasn't coming to his priesthood meetings anymore, and he had just purchased a brand-new car, and it was a 56 Chevrolet. Have you ever seen his 56 Chevrolet? Boy, there wasn't a finer car made ever than a 56 Chevrolet. Isn't that right, Brother Jax? Of course, maybe it was a 46 Chevrolet for you. 56 for me. <laughs> he had a brand-new 56 Chevrolet, and he thought he was God's gift to women. And this bishop finally had him over to his home because he wasn't getting to him, and he spent three hours with this young man, pleading with him, talking about the pits and all of that and the direction he was going. And he wasn't reaching him. He wasn't able to get to him at all. Finally, the kid said, hey, I've got to go, bishop, and, he, and a little heartsick, the bishop walked this young man back to his car. And as he walked out the house, he saw this beautiful 56 Chevrolet out there, and the bishop had an idea. And he said, will you wait just one more minute? And he said, yeah. And so he went back in the house, and he found a big hunk candy bar. Have you ever seen a big hunk candy bar? They're about big, long candy bar, great candy bar. And he walked out to the car with this young man, and he was talking to him, and he walked back to the rear end of the car, and he slowly undid this candy bar. And when he had it totally unwrapped, he then proceeded to unscrew the gas cap of that car. The young man was watching all this, and before the young man could do anything, he dropped that candy bar into the gas tank. And then he looked at the young man and said, good night, walked in the house. And finally, all the bishop had been trying to tell him hit. And he realized, is that what he's trying to tell me? What I'm doing is the same thing that that candy bar is going to do to my car? And he worshiped that car. Couldn't drive it home, could he? He had visions of that thing getting up into the carburetor and, oh, mess. So he had to go home. He walked home. Bishop didn't offer him a ride. He had to walk home. What do you suppose he was thinking about all the time he walked home? I'll kill that bishop. <laughs> he walked home, and he came back the next day, and he had to drain the gas out, and he had to take the, the gas tank down from the bottom of that car and take it apart and take out the candy bar. And then he had to put the gas tank back together and put it back up underneath that car and fill it with gas. All the time he was doing that, what do you suppose he was thinking about? His whole life, 
That's what he thought about. And he started to come back then because he didn't want his body, his life, to be like that car with a big hunk candy bar going through it. Now, the next thing I want you to think about next time you have a chance to fail, if you don't think about punji sticks and you don't think about drunken Russian soldiers, I want you to think about big hunk candy bar. Okay? There are three things now that you can think about, all of which young people have great power and impact in your lives. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to close tonight by sharing with you a poem, a poem that I had our missionaries memorize some time ago, which I think sort of wraps up the way I feel about this challenge we have of listening in the training session so that we can go out into the world and face this pits and miss them. And this poem is written by William Shakespeare. Now, we all know and love William Shakespeare. <laughs> and this poem that he wrote was entitled The Rape of Lucrece. And the story behind this poem is, it's the story of a man by the name of Lucius Tarquinius. And he is contemplating, thinking about, raping the beautiful Lucrece. And as he is thinking about this ugly thing, the thoughts that go through his mind are these. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. He said to himself, what win I if I gain the thing I seek? A dream, a breath, a froth of fleeting joy? Who buys a minute's mirth to wail a week? Or sells eternity to get a toy? For one sweet grape, who would the vine? destroy? Or what fond beggar but to touch the crown would with the scepter straight be stricken down? You get the message of that poem, young people. Learn that, will you? Every time you have an opportunity to fail, think of the first line of that poem. What win I if I gain the thing I seek? A dream, a breath, a froth, a fleeting joy. Who buys a minute's mirth to wail a week. Now, what kind of people do that, young people? What kind of people buy a minute's mirth to wail a week? Dumb people. Isn't that right? Dumb people. Or sells eternity to get a toy. What kind of people sell eternity for a toy? Dumb people. Isn't that right? For one sweet grape, who would the vine destroy? Now, what kind of people for one grape would destroy the whole vine? Dumb people. That poem is about dumb people, young people. <laughs> Think about that as you have your opportunity to fail. Will you? What win I if I do this thing? A dream, a breath, a froth of fleeting, momentary pleasure. Who buys a minute's mirth to wail a week? Dumb people. Or sells eternity to get a toy? Dumb people. Or for one sweet grape, who would the vine destroy? Not you, I hope. Think about that, will you? Follow the counsel of Shakespeare. Follow the counsel of your advisors, your parents, your bishop, your stake president. Avoid the pits. As a bishop, I have the the task and responsibility on many occasions of having to pull some of my young people out of those pits. And it's no fun. It's ugly. And when you see the pain and the anguish that they go through, I'd do anything to prevent you from having to go through the same thing. The Lord paid for our sins. He experienced the pain and the anguish for us. If we will just allow him in our lives and allow him to pay for our mistakes, we don't have to go through that pain. And if we choose to go through that pain anyway, what kind of people are we? Dumb people. Well, don't be dumb. You're smart. You're wiser than that. Will you learn, young people? I plead with you, young people, to stay close to the Lord. Avoid the pits. And experience all of the blessings that come from obeying the principles of the gospel. 
Obey, young people, whether you want to or not. And as you obey for just obedience sake, if that's why you're obeying, you'll still get the blessings. And as you mature and grow and you look back, you'll be able to say, thank God I obeyed. Because now I understand why the Lord asked me to keep myself clean. I bear my witness that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. The Lord lives. He loves you, young people. He knows who you are. He has a job for you to perform, but he needs you to be clean. Remember the pits. Remember the Russian soldiers and leaning out windows. Remember the candy bars. Remember that poem from Shakespeare, and you'll stay clean. And someday you look back and be very happy you did. I bear this witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.